Thanks to everyone for coming. You know, um, I'd like to just give you a, just a brief bio that Mr. Dunbar is too humble to, to tell you about himself. Although he knew Zebi, he spent most of his adult years in Haifa, Israel, uh, spent 22 years on the House of Justice, the governing body of the Baha'i world community. And before that, 15 years on the first ever appointed International Teaching Committee since the early 1970s. And before that, he was also working in the trenches of Nicaragua as a pioneer for the Baha'i faith and in Latin American countries where he and his wife Marilyn had many challenging conditions that they met with great tenacity. He didn't do these things just because he had nothing better to do. He was already an up and coming actor and set designer in Hollywood. And he left that life to devote himself to the faith. But I think when we, when we think about his topic tonight about the verities of the faith, we have to think about not only the, the spiritual concepts as they, as they appear on paper, but how we live them. And one of the greatest examples we had in the life of Baha'u'llah was the, the quality of sacrifice. And so it's wonderful to hear these messages from someone who has spent his life sacrificing for his faith. So it's my humble privilege to introduce to you a very dear soul and Baha'i, Mr. Hoover Dunbar. You, I'm online now, you can hear me now? Yes, Mr. Bunbar, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for your kind invitation. Uh, this is interesting to uh, see the faces of some of you, some of which I know have been known from the past. And as you say, this is in the memory of Zebi, of Ozzy Whitehead. I used to always call him Ozzy. I don't know. They didn't say Zebi much when he was in California. And uh, he was also very gracious. I met him on a few trips back to the United States when I was pioneering in Central America. And uh, he was very gracious to me, he actually hosted me while I was there and was never tiring in reporting his, the events with the Guardian and his pilgrimage, very special. We'll come back to that later on if you like it. Uh, uh, close to the end of the evening. Uh, the subject uh, tonight was a kind of overview of the Baha'i faith. In other words, how do we get a picture of what the Baha'i faith is in a short time? And that's always a challenge because of the immense scope of the Baha'i teachings and the worldwide impact of his revelation. Uh, we we are going to touch on certain points and I'm basing this on the elucidation that Shoghi Effendi gave for the, to a United Nations committee, which was considering the role of religions in the Holy Land and asked the guardian to state what was the Baha'i faith and what was its relationship to Palestine at that time, and now, of course, Israel. Uh, for those of you who are, are not familiar with the Baha'i history, Shoghi Effendi was the world leader, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, uh, and was the great grandson of the founder of the faith, Baha'u'llah. Uh, in his descriptions to, to the committee, he right off talks about the, the faith having been established by Baha'u'llah, the first sentence of everything, he comes out, out with Baha'u'llah's name, which I think is important in uh, when we're describing the faith, we want to um, say, what is it based on? And of course, it's based on Baha'u'llah's teachings on the scope of his revelation. And... Uh, he announces that he was um, born in Persia, 
that was pre pre Iranian days. In the middle of the 19th century, he, as a result of the faith established by Baha'u'llah, I want to read the sentence to you because it's so uh, comprehensive. The faith established by Baha'u'llah was born in Persia about the middle of the 19th century and has, a res as a result of the successive banishments of its founder, culminating in his exile to the Turkish penal colony of Akka and his subsequent death and burial in its vicinity, fixed its permanent spiritual center in the Holy Land and is now in the process of laying the foundations of its world administrative center in the city of Haifa, which is slightly south of Akka. Then he, to bring to the attention of this distinguished committee, quite a large committee, internationally oriented, uh, he says that there are two things which um, establish in our minds that the Baha'i faith, Baha faith claims to be a world religion. One, he said, of course, it's the unequivocal assertions of his author, of the author of the faith, the revelation, who is the, I should say, one of the unique ones in history that could pronounce on his own position and role. And then he said that's countered on the other side with the general growth of the Baha'i faith, which in that time had spread to many, many countries in the world and was about to reach out and establish itself some presence of Baha'is in the remaining territories. Abdul Baha, Shoghi Fani's grandfather, had given a divine plan for the spread of the Baha'i faith, for the teachings of Baha'u'llah, and he named 130 territories, countries and territories around the world. And uh, Shoghi Effendi had a plan encouraging Baha'is to settle in all those places. So we have on the one hand, Baha'u'llah's claims that he has brought a new message from God. And on the other hand, the influence that that's had within mm, hundred and some odd years after he had proclaimed the faith. Uh, he states that this, is a, that this world religion is destined to evolve in the course of time into a world embracing commonwealth. And the advent of this commonwealth will signalize a golden age for, for mankind, for the human race. And the thing that will characterize this new golden age is recognition of the unity of the human, faith, human race, the whole human race, all humanity. Uh, also the recognition that it, ha it was attaining to its stage of maturity and that through this establishment, through this maturity, a glorious destiny was unfolding before the human race in which a world encompassing civilization would be born and flourish. So this is the long scale vision of what Paola has come for. He has come to proclaim the unity of mankind and that it is the will of our creator who is the voice and founder and author of all the great religions of the past, showing that this is a, a one world faith, one spiritual teaching that's flowing down from our eternal creator down through the ages. And it's a restatement of the eternal verities of those faiths, plus a larger elaboration of those basic truths than has ever been given in the recorded religious history that we have. Uh, then he, uh, he points out that the unity that we're coming to, the unity of humanity that he announces and promises and foreshadows has been evolving since the days of Adam through a long religious cycle from Adam himself on right through to the coming of the Baha'i faith. 
and it went through different stages of social development. It, uh, through the inspiration and uh, guidance that came to it through a series of progressive revelations, all from the same God, has brought us to, to a stage uh, where we can look back on it and see the evolving uh, original, the, the family unities established in the very earliest days of the cycle and moving on to tribal unities and then to city-states and finally to the stage of independent nationhood and now in with the appearance of Baha'u'llah and his proclamation of the meaning of, of uh, religion in this day, the purpose of God has with his creation and indeed with his creatures has arrived and that is the stage of the recognition of the oneness and wholeness of the human race. And this will require, of course, the uh, voluntary uh, leaguing together of all the nations of the world in, in, a, in, a, in a federal vision, in a vision of one mankind where the representatives of all the different nations and the representatives of, of science and art, everyone will collaborate in making the plans, applying the steps which will lead us to a full unification. Indeed, the kingdom of God on earth as has been promised in the past holy books. So from the Baha'i point of view, you suddenly, it's a bit like the first time we looked at the planet from space. We had vision images coming from space and we looked at this planet and it just threw the limits of our consciousness outward in all directions. That uh, very exciting uh, prospect of seeing the world as one world, which of course wasn't really conceivable in the earlier stages. I think, you know, pretty much the earth was still flat when Jesus appeared and also when Muhammad appeared. And it's, it's, it's only after that that we've begun to mutually discover among the continents the, the scope of the globe and all of the people that, that live on it and how fast the human race is multiplying. So Baha'u'llah says that uh, it's incumbent upon us to reflect on his revelation, to hear his teachings, that he has delivered them in a selfless manner. He himself submitted to being a prisoner. He, of course, was persecuted because of the establishment of the, the religious systems of the past. They didn't want any competition. And uh, indeed, the new revelations from God, the new religions as they appear, appear because the followers and the leaders of the previous revelation have become superficial or completely misguided in their representations about the previous faith. So it's become important for each religion, for its uh, vested interest, to establish itself as the last religion. In other words, the Jews, that's the end of it, and Christians, that's the end of it, and the Muslims, that's the seal of the prophets, and that's the end of it. And Baha'u'llah points out that uh, all of the messengers of God of the past have confirmed the prior manifestation or appearance of divine guidance in prophets before them, and also have promised uh, the appearance of other prophets in the future, indeed, the reappearance of themselves in some cases. I mean, I find that a bit odd, but then when you hear Baha'u'llah's explanation that the manifestations of God have a twofold station, one of them is a, an eternal oneness in which their inner reality is the immediate light manifested by God for the guidance of human creatures through the manifestation himself so that he becomes the mirror of the central orb of the universe, of the divine essence, sublime and unknowable in himself. And he makes himself known to us through these manifestations. So this is 
one voice that comes to us. And indeed, the different prophets of God have said this, you know, that they're the return of the past manifestation, or they are even identical with the past manifestation or past prophets of God. And so gradually, from this view that we've taken of the whole planet, we also, from the view of the Baha'i faith, we see a whole range, a whole uh, epic cycle of the appearance of these lights of divine guidance down through the ages, moving us gradually one stage further in the social complexity of mankind until we've reached this moment when indeed we have the mandate from God to move forward with the unification of mankind. As in past revelations, those of you who are familiar with, with their religious history will recognize that at the appearance of any single one of these prophets, there's been a backlash. There's been a terrific uh, upsurge of persecution against them because they seem to be uh, undoing the social order of the time. And indeed they are. They've come to renew revelation in all of its aspects. One of its aspects has to do with the eternal laws of God and that they renew those and they, they're the same in each religion. The unity of God, the love of God, the uh, eternality of the human soul, once it turns to the, to the words of God, the verb of God. And then uh, the other side of it are the social teachings which each prophet brings, which are, he abrogates the ones of the previous cycle or confirms them, and then establishes new guidelines for human behavior and for uh, indeed not only uh, our individual ethical uh, constraints and position that we, we need to adopt, but the guidance for nations uh, through kingship and through the appearance of, na of nationhood around the world. And, and now he's calling for the leaders of mankind to gather together and consider these points. They, um, he wrote to the kings and rulers of mankind from his, from his prison cell and his, uh, his exile in the Holy Land. Baha'u'llah addressed them all in resounding ways. And when they rejected his message, he said that they had rejected what could have become the most great peace if they'd followed through at that time. But he said now he, he hopes they will hold to a lesser peace. That would be a political unification of mankind without being directly related in the first stages with any religion. But gradually the influence of the um, energies, the spiritual forces and energies released by any revelation, mankind begins to come into the fold and understand it and see the reasons for it. And in the case of Baha'u'llah, his, his teachings are, are so wise and broad that they, they now, uh, in many cases, are affirmed by the members of the human race as highly reasonable. I wanted to uh, review one thing before we go on, and that is uh, the fundamental pr principle that you could understand has been uh, referred to here as the religious truth being relative and not absolute, and that revelation is progressive in its character. It's never ending. It's never begun, and it's never ending. It goes on and on and on, and we're entering into a new cycle of spiritual development. And Baha'u'llah indeed says that his revelation is not the last revelation, but will be succeeded by a long series of revelations, which will develop and enrich this divine civilization, which he's foretold. 
the idea of religious truths being relative and not absolute is, is an important one because uh, otherwise we're stuck with the, the laws and teachings of the past which don't match uh, the needs of our present hour. Now you would say, well, how can truth be relative and not absolute? Well, again, earlier on, I was mentioning about the earth was not discovered. For, for Christ to proclaim the oneness of the human race, when the human race was not yet discovered or known, the limits of it, uh, would have been impossible to understand. Now we've come to a stage where we recognize the oneness of the, of the globe and of all the continents. And the, this idea can be broached and considered and weighed and understood. Um, who, who knows if, if in some distant future we have a, a relationship with some other planet in the, the universe. Now that we're getting broaching the idea that they are there, they may be inhabited. Some of them may be inhabited and so on. So th this is not the time for laws relating these two worlds to each other. That's a relative truth for the future, so to speak. But the time we're living in needs a clear declaration of truths as we can understand them uh, in the situation that the world is presently facing. With regard to progressive revelation, Shoghi Fendi is, is, is summarizes this. He says that there, and this uh, turns out to be nine aspects related to this, that religious truth is not absolute but relative, which we've discussed briefly here, that the d divine revelation is a continuous and progressive process, that all the great religions of the world are divine in origin, that their basic principles are in complete harmony. Their aims and purposes are one and the same. Their teachings are but facets of one truth. That their functions are complementary and that they differ only in the non-essential aspects of their doctrines. And that their missions represent successive stages in the spiritual evolution of human society is such a thing as spiritual evolution of human society and that's been clearly identified in the Baha'i teachings and of course the evidence and proof of this is in the scriptures of the past religions all of which he's telling us are in complete harmony the principles of them are in complete harmony the food laws may differ because of certain circumstances the marriage laws and things of that sort may differ. The type of obligatory prayers we may be called upon to recite changes. These things are the outer circumstance, the clothing, if you will, of the outside of the truth of divine revelations. And they will change again in the future. But the eternal teachings remain to inspire us. Now I wanted to go briefly into some of the basic Baha'i teachings. Uh, these, the, this will give you a kind of an overview of, of the beliefs of the Baha'is as proclaimed by Baha'u'llah and elaborated by his son, Abdu'l Baha. So the Baha'i faith upholds the unity of God. There's only one God recognizes the unity of his prophets. They're all linked together internally, spiritually. It inculcates the principle of the oneness and wholeness of the entire human race. It proclaims the necessity and the inevitability of the unification of mankind. This is coming. We see now how, how interdependent we are, how much we need international collaboration with the, the pres present uh, crisis of the pandemic more and more different aspects of, uh, the, of the world are, are demonstrating that to us. He asserts that this unification uh, 
is gradually approaching and these various stages, it doesn't all happen at once, it's, but it's coming about. He claims that nothing short of the transmuting spirit of God working through his chosen mouthpiece in this day can ultimately succeed in bringing it about. We need the guidance of a new revelation to move from stage to stage in the social evolution of mankind. It enjoins upon its followers the primary duty of an unfettered search after truth. It condemns all manners of prejudice and superstition. That would cover the whole gamut of political, racial, ethical, religious, all the prejudices that, that we store and are really based on false information. Once we get the clarification of things, it begins to they begin to fall, these prejudices begin to fall away. And very needed now with the coming recognition of the oneness and wholeness of the human race. Abdul Baha declares that we are all the flowers of one garden. We may be different color, different shapes, different fragrances, but just as in a garden, that adds to the harmony and beauty of the garden. So the mixing of the races of mankind in a interchange that's taking place now with all of the movement of refugees and things which is also driving the unification of mankind because it puts us in touch with people that we didn't know anything about and gradually we need to learn how to live with them live with each other so it declares that the purpose of religion is the promotion of amity and concord amongst human souls and it proclaims that religion is in essential harmony with science. Science is another aspect of truth. Uh, in the Bible, teaching, it says that the, God has revealed two books. The book of Revelation, which is the book that the prophets of God are delivering us to it in progressive stages. And also then the other book, he says, is the book of creation the open tablet of existence, because God is the creator and maintainer and sustainer of all the physical reality that we have around us, the material reality we have around us. And they, all of these various aspects of creation uh, have truths related to them. They involve secrets to be discovered as we're doing through our scientific uh, research and experimentation. And likewise, the book of Revelation contains mysteries and secrets. And Abdu'l Baha says that through the study of science and the physical creation, we come to understand better the truths of the book of Revelation, because the book of Revelation is full of science talking about likenesses, uh, comparisons with physical reality, because that's the reality we have in front of us and from which we're learning how to recognize reality, how to penetrate truth. And so he says, the more you study the book of Revelation, the more you appreciate the book of creation, and the more you study the creation, it also so they interact with each other, and he says they're in complete harmony. We will come to find how complete is the harmony between divine truths and physical realities. It says that we should recognize religion as the foremost agency for the pacification and the orderly progress of human society. Um, this seems to contradict everything we know about religion, the outer religious history in the past centuries. There's been so much strife and the basis of war and misunderstanding. It's because it has been misused, misunderstood, misinterpreted, and... Uh, aspects of it have been taken over by leadership with uh, very poor motives, very base motives. So we have to rescue, we have to have a, a clear enunciation of what is, actually is religion. This force that comes from God from age to age, 
to draw us back into a, a singularity of vision, enable us to go forward as a human race. And this then leads to the pacification and the orderly progress of human society. It, uh, the faith also, by all us teachings, maintained the principle of equal rights, opportunities, and privileges for men and women. This is a great new stage in the development of uh, religious teachings. So the first of the manifestations which is so clearly set forth, equal rights and opportunities for men and women. And to such a degree that in, with respect to education, he says, if you're in a family and you can't educate, you don't have the means to educate your sons and your daughters, you should educate first your daughters because your daughters become the first teachers of the next generations. So that's quite, quite, quite a, a change and contrast in that. And now, of course, women are entering into every aspect of human life and certainly capable of acting at any level. Um, Baha'u'llah insists on compulsory education. He says you, you, he, doesn't, he doesn't have the means or the way to enforce that, but he calls upon the leaders of mankind to consider the education and to promote a universal curriculum, which will put us all on one basis. And it suggests the adoption of a universal tongue so that we can all speak the same language. And very quickly in one or two generations, we'll have the arts and sciences and everything in this world language. We have to drop our own language in the meanwhile, but we, we do need something that facilitates our mutual understanding. He said that we need to, uh, humanity needs to take measures to limit the extremes of poverty and wealth. That they've become too far extreme. No one should be suffering so that they don't have enough to eat and shelter. And likewise, uh, humanity may need to consider some limit to the levels of individual wealth that can be accumulated by, by private parties as part of the reorganization of mankind. Uh, he abolishes the institution of priesthood. He said, we've come to an age where we each should investigate religious truth from the books of God. We now have the ability to have the books printed. We have uh, the ability to read them. We can read the past scriptures, come to our own understanding. We can read for our whole area of science and all the physical sciences we can look at and that uh, we don't need priests anymore. They've been the cause of confusion in the past. So he also provides then a, a program to how to organize our religious life through a series of elected uh, representatives of, of the Baha'i community, wherever there are is a community of Baha'is. They elect a local assembly and then the local assemblies in a country elect annually a national spiritual assembly and finally there's a a world international world body at the head of the baha'i faith called the universal house of justice and it it sits in the holy land in israel he prohibits slavery this is the first pronouncement slavery has existed you know for for centuries but this is the first pronouncement in scripture itself that it's abolished, it's to be eliminated entirely. Also asceticism, mendicancy, and monasticism. So these things are reach on beyond the limits of how humans should behave and we have to provide for means for, so we don't have to have people begging in the streets and uh, so on, or living in isolation from others to gain spirituality. He says we should gain spirituality through service to each other, through service to the human race. He prescribes monogamy. The faith prescribes monogamy. It discourages divorce. It emphasizes the necessity of strict obedience to one's government. We're not anarchists. We follow the laws of the land. We try to uplift the 
spirit and outlook of the people wherever we live through the sharing of these teachings. He's exalted work as performed in the spirit of service to the level of worship. In other words, it, it, in the sight of our creator, if we're serving, selflessly serving others through, the, through our employment, through our services, through our discoveries, that that is considered also worship. Of course, he establishes a program of worship. He gives, uh, prescribes prayers, which will assist us to develop spiritually and reflect the qualities of God so that we might aspire after the ideal of being created in the image and likeness of God. Finally, uh, he delineates the outlines of those institutions that must establish and perpetuate the general peace of mankind. One of his fundamental teachings is universal peace. How to attain to it is an important, very important function the human race has to look and discover and establish those uh, institutions and agencies which will protect us. And he provides a scheme for that in his teachings as well. The faith is based on the appearance and teachings of three central figures. Baha'u'llah, who was the founder of the faith himself, was preceded by uh, a religious figure entitled the Bab, which means the gate, the gate from the east in which the glory of the Lord entered the world. Oh, these are uh, all religious, okay, religious references. And uh, many people have now abandoned religion altogether. It's because the situation of religion became so bad that, and the efforts of atheists to deny the very existence of a creator, although it seems quite irrational how one could imagine that all this would come to exist without a maker without a designer, without an intelligence behind such a complexity of a universe. The, the Bob appeared uh, several years before Baha'u'llah and announced that he was the one of the in the line of these great prophetic beings and he, he stirred the country with his spiritual teachings to such a degree that the, the whole country was in a, in a uh, revolution of spiritual thought and so on. On this great upset, the ruler of the country and also the shahs of that time and also the religious clergy, the Shia Islamic clergy, and they began to persecute and uh, eradicate the, the followers of the Bab. And they finally publicly executed the Bab himself, uh, calling upon a regiment of 750 riflemen to shoot him. Now you can imagine how important they thought he was that that should have that many people needed to, to wipe him out, to kill him. He was a glorious being. He, his teachings were are now beginning to be translated and promulgated. And besides his, uh, the explanations he gave of past holy books and past scriptures, he also announced the coming of one greater than him. And it was after some years, uh, Baha'u'llah, made his appearance and he later identified himself with this promised one of the Bob. And they had been in communication in their lifetimes. And Baha'u'llah had served as a disciple of the Bob for a time. Then Baha'u'llah uh, was in the Holy Land, was in exile in the Holy Land and he passed away there in 1892. And he appointed his eldest son known in the world as Abdu'l-Bahá to be his successor and the implementer and the interpreter of his teachings. And Abdu'l-Bahá 
who had been a prisoner with Baha'u'llah. At the time of the Young Turks Revolution, all the religious um, and political prisoners of the state were released. And Abdu'l-Bah was then free to be able to travel to the West. And he traveled to Africa, to Egypt. And from there, after a time, uh, diffusing the Baha'i teachings there, he went on to Europe and spoke in all the great capitals and um, addressed uh, many, many leaders of thought and his talks in Europe. And then eventually, he traveled to America, traveled across America in a nine-month uh, trip and uh, established uh, many Baha'i uh, fundamentals in his, in his uh, conversations, in his talks to the public. Uh, I think it's been estimated some 90,000 people heard his talks in 1912. 1911, 1912, and 1913 were the years of his travel. And when he passed away in 1921, after the Great War, the First War, World War, uh, he left the faith in the hands of his grandson, who became the guardian of the faith. And that's Shoghi Effendi, and it's from his summary of the Baha'i teachings that we're talking with you today. Thank you, Mr. Dunbar. That was a beautiful summary of all of the things that we we all have heard and, and sometimes forget and a beautiful expression of the, the collection of treasures within the Baha'i faith that uh, are uh, expression of God's will for humanity in this age. Mm -hmm.